Okay, you're good. All right, look at you, you got me. Ah, and then I like hit 80 things anyway. Okay. All right. It's going to be one of those weeks. Um, first week always is. Well, welcome to Bio 30. So as I mentioned, today we're going to go ahead and hit the ground running. So our first unit is really an introductory unit. And it's designed to make sure that no matter where you've come from, that everyone is going to start this class at the exact same playing field. Um, so no matter if you're coming from high school, what your high school looked like that, if you're coming um, as a non-traditional student, whatever the case is, we're all going to start at the exact same starting arena, the exact same terms, the exact same everything. Um, and so this is really going to focus on what are the major themes of this class, and then we're going to really look at some experimental design. So the first thing that I want to um, go over is um, some email stuff. <coughs> and this becomes uh, more important at the beginning of the semester um, with any of your faculty and TAs because we have not learned who you are yet. Um, so I get a lot of emails at the beginning that just says, hey, um, I'm having trouble seeing your class or I can't figure out what section I'm supposed to be in. Can you help me? And the answer is always, yes, I absolutely can help you. I have absolutely no idea who you are. Um, <laughs> um, and it's really probably more stressful for you guys because it ends up being five or six emails. And most of the time I know you guys need faster help than that. So one of the things that you can do to help yourself more is add that second section sentence of this is the class that I'm in. I'm usually pretty quick at learning your names and faces, harder now, because um, I have to learn your eyes and your hair. <laughs> um, but I get pretty good at it, particularly since I'm your only lab instructor in the spring, so I get to learn your faces much faster um, than I do in the fall. But it's still really helpful if you just let me know, hey, I'm in Bio 130, um, I'm in your lecture, or I'm also in your Tuesday lab, or whatever it is, because then I can start to place who you are right away. Um, and I know, oh, you're not in zoology, or oh, you're not in ecology, or whatever it is that I'm doing. So I immediately know what kind of help you need. Later on in the semester, I'm going to know who you are because you, you know, you said, oh, I'm Carolyn. Okay, I'm Carolyn. That's fine. When you're talking about getting help, anything that you're doing for any instructor or TA, the more specific you can be is always the better. And usually the key here is making sure that you don't have to send like 80 emails to get the same help, right? So if you ask, my question is about homework five. Okay, okay, can still answer it, okay? But I'm probably gonna have to send several emails back that says, and what about homework five? Would you like help with? Okay, or right if you say, I don't understand question five or homework five. Okay. Okay. That I can probably tackle on my own, but I may need, you're probably going to have to wait. Right? Because 90% of the time, unless I'm sitting at my desk, I do all my emails from here. Right? Or if you send me a reminder question, which my husband loves. Okay. I'm sure most of you know e learn sucks from your phone. It's not great. Um, so re pulling up, I mean, I wrote the homeworks, but I do not have all of the questions memorized on them, and most of your teachers for other classes don't either. So if you can be specific and say, this is the problem I don't understand, I can type an answer back to that right away. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Right? Let me tell you, you know, what it is that's going on here. I can type an answer back to that. We can't talk about that in the Remind app. Right? This is very easy to tackle. Okay, whether or not I have a homework up or my computer up in front of me. So the more specific you can be in your question, right, the quicker a response that you'll get back. Whether it's an email, um, a chat box thing, right, or um, a reminder. app. So um, be very cognizant of these kinds of things. Um, and it just will make your life probably less stressful. Right? Keeping in mind, too, if you're emailing late at night or messaging, I'm using the word email very generally, right? There are always many ways to get a hold of somebody. Um, you already might be waiting until the next day, and then if you waited all the way until the next day, and the email you get back is, 
I'm not quite sure I understand what you're asking. Can you clarify? That can be very frustrating for you. So make sure you kind of save yourself a little bit. The same goes if you're emailing or messaging on the Remind app, um, any of your TAs. Of course, I've used Jasmine here because she happens to be our TA. We will encounter many others. You always want to be very specific for her as well. We only have one section now. This won't be the cases for, say, your comm classes or anything else that you encounter. Being the most specific is always helpful. Um, do be aware that the TAs also can't see some stuff. So like for your lab, sometimes they can help you, sometimes they can't, um, but they can't see stuff. So for them, like Jasmine took the class, but it's been a little while. So um, they're kind of gone completely on memory for that stuff. So be patient um, and honest with the materials. And so you may need to say, can you? help me with lab stuff, and if they say yes, then bring stuff to them, right? Because they can't just, she has all of our lecture you learn pages, she's nothing else. Because she's not the lab TA. Um, and same thing with, if she has stuff hooked up to the phone, I right, don't, like, text her at 2 in the morning. Okay. Um, oh, one other thing I want to remind you guys. Um, it's really funny, so I like telling the story anyway. You can text my office phone. I don't know why it lets you do that, but you can. And it's super weird. Um, and it ends up texting me like a weird therapist. So it'll say things like, Jasmine Lafferty has left you a voicemail. And then it'll like weirdly Alexa respond to me with your text and like five voicemail messages. I don't care if you do this. Just be aware that I'm going to get it. It's not going to forward it to my email. It's not going to give me it as a text. It's going to read it like that. <clears throat> so just be aware that if you text my, my phone, that's where it's going, and it's going to sit in my office overnight, so it's not coming any faster. I don't know why it does it either. It's a whole weird thing. But it is a landline. It's super cool, and it's super weird. Um, so just be aware that that's also a thing. Any questions about any of this stuff? And keep this in mind as well when you're sending your badge requests. Um, I get that every once in a while where students just say, I want to open like a homework or the last homework. Um, always just make sure you tell me what you want. You can pretty much always have it unless it's something like that's passed, but you just need to tell me what you're having. Okay, so all of my uh, PowerPoints that I do with you guys, we're always going to start with a roadmap. So this is what we're going to do for this unit, right? As I mentioned, the first thing we're going to go through is what exactly is this course going to be about? So we're going to do some minor background, make sure everybody's on the same sort of playing field. And then we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at parts of an experiment, right? So what does it mean to build an experiment? What are some important terms that we need, okay? And a lot of this is going to overlap with what you're going to do in lab, either this week or next week, depending on whether you're group A or group B. Whew. So let's get started. Um, so what I want to do first is think about what is biology exactly, right? Which we know is the study of living organisms, right? Which is a bit reductive. So what I want to talk about first is, well, what does it mean to to be alive. So, wow, that really delayed, didn't it? Uh, let's start by thinking about what it is a feature of a living organism. So we're going to start by practicing with one of our in-class engagement activities. Um, so what I want you to do is get some sort of electronic tool out, and I don't care what you use, it can be your phone, or it can be a computer. And what you're going to do is go to this website, menti.com. And when you go there, it's going to let you input a code. And here's your code 6687034. And when you put that code in, it's going to pop up my screen for you.
And once you do that, right, so I can see how many of you are playing along with me. I want you to think about what is at least one feature that you would use to identify whether an organism is alive. Okay, now specifically think about not alive versus dead, right? But alive versus never living. <coughs> yeah. Well, early in necessity doing that, huh? All right. A lot of really good ones on here. So let's take a look at what you guys came up with, and then we have the I have the final list on the next page. So don't panic about trying to fill these in as I walk through them. So, um, some of your biggest ones, and I'm going to apologize if this reloads on me here and then moves them all. So, this comes up a couple of times, and of course, going to use different sizes um, if you spell them differently. But reproduction, right, is a big one, right? So, passing on immortality in a way, right? Biological immortality to the next generation. So this is one for sure. I know I saw this one on here more than once, but at the very least. This is a big one, right? Being made of cells. So growth on here certainly more than once. Okay, to grow and expand those cells. I see energy, specifically glycolysis on here. A bunch, right? So the intake of energy is a good one. Right, so I'm consuming energy, consuming and processing energy. Glycolysis is, of course, specifically referring to the intake and processing of sugar energy. <clears throat> Metabolism is the processing of that energy. Oh, here's the other cells. <laughs> I didn't even circle like the biggest growth, or did it move on me? We'll pretend. <clears throat> I see adaptation also on here in various forms. And we're going to see this as well. Right, to adapt or respond to stimuli. So both of these will be on here. So that on here too. Sensitivity. Count that. 
Okay, we see this as well. Okay. Let's see, am I missing something? DNA is a good one. Two semesters in a row, I didn't see the big, big one. So I usually see this. And I'm really impressed. I didn't see this one pop up in here. Why would heartbeat not be a good answer? Good, right? So there's lots of organisms. Oh, that was an English was it? Lots of organisms, such as single-celled organisms, right, or plants that are definitely alive, okay, but that don't have hearts. Right, great job. All right, so you guys really hit a vast majority here right, of the features that we need to be a living organism. So let's look at our cohesive list here. Put these in a list. Yes, thank you. Uh -uh. and talk about them. So you can see here that you've got every single one, I think. So really, great job. <clears throat> so here we see number one, that cells one that you guys nailed. All right. So we need to have one or more cells. See, we're going to clarify the one or more, right? Because as we just noted, you can be a single cell organism and you're still alive. Or you can be made of many cells, like we are, and you're alive. But at least one cell needs to exist in your body. And you guys nailed these two as well. And we need to intake energy in some form. Right, and there's going to be a wide variety of this. I can intake sunlight. Okay, I can intake chemical energy. And that can be sulfur, for example. I can be extremophile. I can intake <clears throat> nitrate. I right, can be like, oh, so I can intake a cheeseburger. That's good for you. Okay. But I'm going to import that energy, and then I'm going to break that energy down. I'm going to metabolize and use that energy. Incorporate it into my body. Okay. Then I'm going to grow. Okay, so I'm a non-stagnant organism. Okay, so a single cell is going to grow from being a gentle cell to a big cell. Okay, but multicellular organisms also grow. We have little fungi and big fungi, little humans and big humans. So we're taking that energy. Okay, and taking at least part of it okay, and investing it into self-growth. Okay, investing it into our own cells, our own body. All right, respond to stimuli. Okay, this can mean a lot of different things, but basically we're responding to the environment around us. Okay, so we certainly respond to the environment around us, right? I touch something, I can feel that, I can feel pain, I'll move away from that, I feel cold and heat. Okay, plants also do this, right? We can see plants bend away from a shaded area to better get light. It may not be in the second, but certainly it happens, right? Weirdly shaped plants. Right, we see bacteria move away from predators in the water. Okay, adapt. Okay. You can think of antibiotic resistance and bacteria, camouflage and organisms. And then reproduce. You guys got this too. So you, I think you got all seven. Right, so passing on your biological material to the next generation. 
And the DNA is wrapped up in this one, and we'll talk about this as well. And a lot of it has to do with what does it mean to be a cell. All right, great job. Any questions about any of these seven that we talked about? Okay, so you need all seven of these things to be considered a living organism. And this works for a little bitty bacteria all the way up to a great white whale. Don't be rude. Okay, so then let's think about, now that we know what life is, how can we look at life? Right, we just said this can be everything from the very small to the very large. So how do we begin to tackle questions about life? <clears throat> so there are a lot of different ways in which we can view life. And some of these are more intuitive to us than others. So most of what we've talked about so far, root, your root. have been on the right-hand side of my line. Okay. So, right, we can think about things that are individual things, and that's everything that's sort of been on the right-hand side. Right? Very, very small individual items. Right? So, our nitrogen, right, our carbon, I will talk about biomolecules in class. Okay, our organelles, so we already mentioned things like mitochondria. Okay, all of those things will fall in there. And of course, then we mentioned cells themselves. Have to have at least one cell. So a bacteria then could be here. Now you can have many cells put together. You can start asking questions about cells working together to create tissues. You have the tissues, for example, that make up your body. Fat, for example, muscle. Those tissues can work together, create an organ or an organ system. Your heart, your liver, your skin. Big old organ right there, right? You can think about how is that working? So we get up to the level of organism, an individual organism. Right, single person, single squirrel, whatever. And my mammal bias is showing since it's the only thing I can list today. A single tree. Throw Dr. Watson a bone today. Small things. Yeah, but small things that work together, right? So if we think about organs and human tissues, okay, these certainly have been on our mind recently as we think about health. So these are big questions and questions that we answer. I just want to shoot. Thank you. All right. Now, where students tend to get confused is the other side here. I'm drawing in your root. So let's look at the left side. Any, any questions about the blue stuff? I want to make sure that I don't skip over that, even though I have a tendency to. Okay. On the left side of my pink line is the stuff that I think is a little easier to confuse. 
Okay, so we still have our individual organisms. Okay, one squirrel, one tree. Okay, but these next three are kind of easy to mix up. So a population is a group of a single type of organisms. Right, so a population of red squirrel. Right. So we can look at the population of squirrels on campus. And we could look at the population of oak trees in the Kanawha State Forest. Okay, so I'm looking at one thing, oak trees, in one location. It's a very specific thing, one thing. Uh, one group. We want to be careful that we don't mix that up with organism. And now this differs from communities, right? Because like we kind of imagine a community, right? As a community is multiple groups that come together, right? So our communities might be the squirrels that live on campus, the students that live on campus, and the, do we have, I don't care, you guys don't know yet, the oak trees that live on campus. Right? It's a whole bunch of living things that work together and live together. So we have many groups of living things. And this can be as many or as few things as you want it to be, depending on what your question is. It just has to be more than one thing. All right, so organism is just one organism, right? One squirrel. Population is all squirrels. And communities are all squirrels plus all deer plus all grass, whatever, right? With me so far, this feel okay? All right, so let's look at ecosystems then. How can ecosystems possibly differ? So we just said communities were like multiple living things. Well, with our ecosystems then, we have many living things. Some non-living things are also going to be included here. Now remember, when we say non-living, we don't mean dead. All right, so this isn't living deer plus dead deer. That just sounds sad. Okay, so what we really mean are, here's our group of squirrels, here's our group of deer, here's our group of students, okay, here is rocks and soil and rain okay these things are non-living and we're never living okay we don't have sentient rain thankfully i'm scary stuff man so there's no dna in this stuff right it was never alive it's never going to be alive unless we go like hp lovecraft with this because this is the big key. When we're talking about ecosystems, we're really going to broaden our view of how we're asking our question. We want to think about how are these other pieces playing in. Okay. Certainly we think about rain and all of this is food, it's nourishment, rocks and soil is shelter. Maybe these provide important ecosystem resources to everybody. Uh, 
So you can really start to imagine why these are easily confused. So we really want to think about them on a kind of a scale, right, of smallest to biggest. Until we get to the biggest of all, of course, the biosphere. Which is kind of what it sounds like. We can really start to think about these things on a global perspective. Okay, dusts from the desert of the Sahara can blow over into Puerto Rico, right, or Antarctica. Okay, and there's nutrients in that sand that deposit in these places or cause uh, visualization issues. If there's enough of it, it's crazy. Okay, but it matters. And what do we do about that? What is the effect going to be? Okay, these are big biosphere questions that we can ask. Hmm. Okay. Any questions about any of these levels and the way they relate to each other? I can tell this is our favorite topic. All right. Oh, and I have some pictures in here in case. All right. So let's look at some major themes. So, and when I say major themes, what I'm really talking about here is what are the major themes or houses, as I'll call them, that we're going to cover throughout this class. So we have basically three major houses or themes that the rest of the units for the semester are kind of going to fall under. And this is not necessarily the order. You're going to see that we kind of move from smallest to biggest throughout the semester. We're going to start from a molecule and kind of build up to the whole creature and how they're going to interact with each other on an ecological scale. Okay, but in any case, they're all going to fall under these three pieces. Okay, evolution and ecology, cells, and genetics. So let's look at the basics of these three things. So, evolution and ecology. If we're really lucky, we'll get to spend a little bit of time of this at the end. Um, so the core pieces of what makes this work. We're going to talk a little bit about my favorite, which is the steampunk moths. So if we're talking about evolution. Um, basically, the big key here is how we piece this stuff together is using a variety of evidence. Now, originally, of course, we started um, with Cuvier and using some fossils. <clears throat> Work with what you got, right? We didn't have DNA until about, ooh, it's 2020 already, right? So about 30, plus 50, so 80 years ago, that's when DNA really became understood. So before that, we really only had fossils to work with. And then as we added other evidence like DNA, we were able to create this big cohesive piece to understand ultimately how organisms are both related, okay? And how what's it here they change. Right? And that's really the big piece is understanding that, right, when you're here, right, you change. Not you personally, your population. And that's going to be one of the biggest pieces we are going to work with in this class is how populations change. Right? That's one of the first fundamental pieces to work with. So how exactly does that work? How does understanding population relationships and population change work? So the key to understanding population change. So here are my steampunk moths. So if I have a population of moths, I'm in London, and it is the steampunk era. So, we're in the 1800s. We all can kind of picture that steampunk era, right? So, 
kind of like great gritty TV. Cops running around the background. There's that soot in the air. Um, and of course, the soot in the air is because we're wood burning everything. It's really the big accessible heating source for London, which has allowed people to not die. I'm a big fan of people not dying. Um, but of course, as we know, since America did the whole wood burning thing too, it has one of these benefits and disadvantages. Benefits is, you know, people don't freeze to death. Kind of a big benefit. But the disadvantage is it stinks. Right? There's a lot of soot in the air. It has a sexy kind of feel to it on TV. But uh, it's not actually sexy in real life at all. Right? It stinks. It gets in your lungs. And everything is actually sooty everywhere. So the environment around London, and as TV kind of shows you, is really terrible. So I have a birch tree here. And on my birch tree, I have a population of moths. Okay, which has a variety of coloration. Light colored moths and dark colored moths. Now, if you've ever been around a birch tree, birch trees are those trees that have really light white bark. It's kind of flaky. And I kind of all picture that tree. So normally, if I am on this tree and I'm a moth, okay, I'm white versus dark colored, and I'm on a white tree, normally I would be camouflaged, right? White on white. Okay. So if I'm a bird, I'm lazy. I love moths and they are delicious. Also cute with a little fuzzy antenna, okay? But birds eat moths and predators by their nature are just gonna go for the easy meal, okay? So if I have to, go eat a moth, I'm going to pick the first moth I see. Normally, this would be a dark colored moth. White blends on white birch. So here's what ends up happening, however. In the steampunk here, all of this dark colored soot sticks to the tree. Meaning that the trees are not white anymore. They're dark. And so as we see in this image here, It's no longer a benefit to be a light colored moth, right? Because if you're a white moth on a dark tree, it kind of sucks to be you. So our fearsome, don't be rude, bird oppressors eat les moths. Okay? Now, evolution, right, or fundamentally what comes down to natural selection, is based on one very simple concept. If I live, I have babies. If I die, no babies. That's not so bad to get your head around, right? If I, I die, I don't get to have babies because, well, I'm dead. Okay, if I live, I get to have babies. And my babies look like me. So as these very well camouflaged, dark colored moths, I'm more likely to live because the birds are going to have to try harder to find me. And so I get to live, I get to breed, and my babies are going to look like me, also dark colored. As a result, over time, the birds are still going to be more likely to pick up the white colored moths because they stick out like sore thumbs against these steampunk trees, right? The dark colored moths are still likely to live because they're camouflaged, incidentally, being all steampunk and London-y. So as time progresses, more and more dark colored moths live. They get to have babies that look dark colored like they do. Living things have babies, dead things, well, they're dead. And by the end of the process, in this case, about 10 years, we have a population that no longer looks light and dark, but looks dark and slightly darker dark. Right? And those are the individuals that lived and had babies. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about environmental change and natural selection. Right, you've had some kind of pressure, in this case, 
bird that has caused differential survival, right? Literally, they ate somebody. And dead things don't have babies, right? They're not passing on their genes. This is the core system here. Hence, steampunk moths. Does everybody see the process or what we've done here? All right, so this is usually my mantra for sort of the basic natural selection. If you get to live, you achieve immortality biologically, right? You've passed on your genes to the next generation. The next generation will look like you. If you die, guess they don't. Okay, let's go ahead and just start cell theory. This will be our last slide for today. All right, so, so cell theory, okay, what we have um, in red is stuff we already know. And you're going to see I'm going to draw a lot of attention to stuff like this semester, right? So I'm going to call this our stable platform. All right, so this is something you guys already told me when we did our Menti, right? Cells, or what, having cells, right, was one of the features for being a living organism. I like starting with stuff we know. It makes it comfortable, familiar. All right, so there's our familiarity statement. So cell theory then, okay, there's a lot more to cell theory, and we'll talk about this. But the pieces I care that we kind of touch on right now, we've only got two more pieces I want to add on to this. Okay, for these cells that we have to have in order to be alive, there's two more things we need. The first of which is that they're enclosed in some kind of a membrane. Okay, there's a lot of important stuff that we keep inside of a cell. So I kind of think about it like one of those plastic grocery bags that you keep all your groceries in. All right, we've got to keep everything in a grocery bag. We're going to keep everything in our cell in a membrane. Okay, the other thing that our cells need is DNA. Okay. We need something okay, to keep all that genetic information. Okay, that coding that makes us us that we will also then pass on to our offspring. That immortality piece. Oops, that's not right. That is habit. We have a 10 o'clock class. Okay, we do want to make sure that we're in the habit of doing the Socrative. I saw that several of you did not do it on Monday, and I cannot express the importance of making sure you're filling this out, right? Because not only does this count as your attendance, so if you're not doing it, you will not be counted, but also we use this to make sure um, to in, this will inform your study sessions and stuff. So it's really an important feature. So please make sure you're filling this out. Um, today we'll ask you for the teacher's question. So I've circled what you need to fill in for that particular box. And then also I'll send an email out with my study session is Friday at 2.30 and it's focused on your exam if you come to this session. Okay, and once you're all done, the back two rows, you may head out the back door. 